There's a word I want to lift in your hearing tonight found in the book of Genesis, the chapter number three. Genesis at chapter three. Commencing in verse number seven through verse twenty-one. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that I was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule <laughs> over thee. Rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21 reads, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. You may be seated. <laughs> the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk tonight about panic in paradise. Panic in paradise. I've had occasion to visit the state of Hawaii. Hawaii is known as the paradise of the Pacific. Lush vegetation. The most beautiful flowers in the world. You have not tasted a pineapple until you've eaten a pineapple in Hawaii. Beautiful women with grass skirts. Oh yeah, beautiful women with grass skirts. Um, I went to a luau and ate roast pig. Hawaii is a verdant tropical paradise. 
It's known as the paradise of the Pacific. But January 13th of this year, at 8.07 in the morning, there was a panic in that Pacific paradise. Because a worker at the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency pressed the wrong button. Rather than pressing the button for a test alert, he pressed the button for a live alert. And a text message went to every single cell phone in that Pacific paradise. And the message read, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a test. All the cell phones in Hawaii received that message because some months earlier, Kim Jong-un of North Korea had threatened that he had a nuclear missile that could reach the land of the Pacific Paradise in Hawaii. The threat loomed over that Pacific Paradise and one January morning on a Saturday at 8.07 in the morning, the threat went to every cell phone in the state of Hawaii. And for 38 minutes, they were taking shelter. People were calling their loved ones in the mainland. Husbands and wives were kissing and hugging each other in their minds for the last time. People were hiding in basements. They were taking cover in closets and sheltering their children and weeping and screaming and crying. And for 38 minutes, there was a panic in paradise. But I want you to come with me tonight to another panic in paradise. For Adam and Eve are in this garden that God has for them in the east of Eden. And in that paradise, one day, because of Satan and sin, there's panic. Before I delve into a homiletical unfolding and an exegetical presentation of this text, Eve should have knew something was up when she heard a snake talking. I mean, it just should have dawned on Eve that it's a dead cat on the line when you hear a snake talking. And let me say something to Eve in here tonight. If he ain't working, he's a snake talking. Somebody ought to help me preach here tonight. If he riding your car and dropping you to work, he's a snake talking. If you got a job and he getting up at 11 o'clock watching the young and the restless, smoking a joint, talking about the job situation looking bad for the black man, he's a snake talking. This serpent, Lucifer, who was the bright sun of the morning, is now Satan in the form of a serpent. He slithers up to Eve and he casts aspersions on the very word of God. And he comes to Eve because she is the emotional one. He comes to Eve because she is the weaker of the two of them. He comes to Eve because Eve does not get the word because she's not at church. 
Eve gets the message second hand. And whenever you get the word second hand, it always loses something in translation. You ought not ever want nobody to tell you what happened at church. You ought to want to be at church yourself so you can hear the word for yourself because whenever you get the word second hand, it loses something in translation. Eve did not hear God give the command to Adam and so she had to take Adam's word for it. And so Satan comes to her and said, did God say or did Adam say God said? Did God actually say that or did Adam say God said that? Satan, who is so clever, appeals always to the level of your sophistication. And Satan always comes up to you with, that doesn't make sense. You don't believe that. Do you actually believe that if you eat, you're going to surely die? God is keeping something from you. God is hiding something from you, girl. Fine as you are. Good as you look, get that man some of that fruit and see if he don't eat it. Don't let God hold back anything good from you. Think for yourself. You smart enough to know right from wrong. Don't let God lead you around like that. Be your own woman. And then poor Eve, she eats and nothing happens. And the reason nothing happens is because she did not get the command. She is not in charge. Adam is the responsible one. And so Adam comes and poor Adam, he got to eat because he got to sleep tonight. Uh, he, he doesn't really want it, I don't suspect, but he got to live with that woman. And uh, the proverb said it'd be better to live in the corner of a housetop then in a, break, a big broad house with a brawling woman, uh, Adam can't be in the bed with Eve with her fist balled up, ready to fight, and he touch her, don't you touch me. No, Adam got to eat because he got to live with Eve. And Adam been eating from Eve ever since. Because we got to live with y'all, can't live with you, and can't live without you. Uh, uh, you know how some of you Eve people are in here? Uh, just just mad. Just wake up in the morning, mad. Uh, grouchy. Good morning. What's so good about it? How you doing? What you mean how I'm doing? How you doing? Uh, sleep with your fist balled up. Uh, just in case somebody starts something, you ready to fight. Uh, Eve is saying, Adam, eat. Nothing will happen. But when Adam eats, order becomes chaos up becomes down right becomes wrong because God told Adam specifically not to eat stolen fruit is always sweet uh, what we're not supposed to have is always what we want come on help me preach if you can when I was growing up in my little town in Louisiana where I'm from uh, there was a lady who lived across the street from us named Mrs. Mary Dixon. We would go across the street and help Miss Mary cut her grass. She was a widow in her 90s. And we'd go over there and clean her yard for her and, and cut down trees. And we would go there and help her uh, get stuff together for her for, before she went to bed at night. And Miss Mary went to bed about 6.30 after Wheel of Fortune. She'd go to bed. And uh, I'm getting to that point now after Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Uh, somebody here over 50 help me testify uh, we, it, it don't take long for me and uh, and and miss Mary would go to bed and she had a peach she had the peach trees in her yard uh, and miss Mary said y'all pick them up and eat them I'm not gonna eat them I'm it's gonna go to waste y'all just get all the peaches you want we'd wait till miss Mary went to sleep jump the fence and go steal the peaches uh, it looked like to me they taste sweeter because you had to steal them. <laughs> Somebody ought to help me talk here tonight. Um, and, and, and so Adam eats because he acquires knowledge illegitimately. And the illegitimate acquirement of knowledge takes them from ignorant 
innocence to bitter knowledge. And their bitter knowledge causes their eyes to become open. And they see themselves for who they really are. And for the first time in their lives, they are shamed. And brothers and sisters, if sin doesn't make you shame, if sin doesn't break your heart, you need to check your relationship with God. If sin doesn't haunt you, if sin doesn't embarrass you, if sin does not make you ashamed of yourself, you may not be in the right relationship with God. Their eyes are open. And they are in possession of illegitimate knowledge because they have eaten of the garden of the, of, of, of the tree of the garden of good and evil and their eyes are open and they are naked and they are ashamed. And immediately panic strikes paradise. Paradise in that moment is lost because they have disobeyed God. Walk with me around the text. In their disobedience, God came to them. He could have stayed away. He could have left them in their bitter knowledge. He could have let them die in their sinful condition. But God loved them so much that in spite of of their disobedience, he came. Are y'all listening to me? No matter how much they displeased God, he came. No matter how far they'd walked away from God, he came. No matter how low they sunk in disobedience to God, he still came. They broke his heart, but he came. They disappointed God, but he came. They fell from their holy estate, but God still came. And I'm so glad tonight that when I fell, God came. When I walked like I didn't even know him, he came. When I didn't look like a Christian or talk like a Christian or sound like a Christian or God still came. He came through 42 generations. He came. Yes, he did. Uh, he was the ancient of days who became the infant of days. He was the event in eternity who became the advent in the context of time. He was divinity who tabernacled in a tenement of clay. He was God who let dust be painted on his spirit. He came. I said he came. He came and let himself be born. He came and he let himself die. He came and he let himself be resurrected. He came to me so I could come to him. He became what I am. That I might become what he is. I came to Jesus. As I was. Weary. Worn and sad, but I, I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He came to me, he came. Walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And brothers and sisters, as a hurry, when he came to them, he also called them. He came 
And then he called. Adam, where are you? Adam, not Eve. Adam, where are you? Now you know God knew where Adam was. God came and he called Adam and he was not calling because he was looking for information. He was calling looking for confession. Adam, where are you? Not in terms of your geographical location, but where are you in terms of your spiritual condition? know where you are geographically I want you to tell me where you are spiritually and Mount Zion God is asking somebody in here tonight where are you I know where you are in your spatial temporal relationship in terms of the universe but where are you in your spiritual condition where are you in your relationship with God I know you it's sitting down in Mount Zion, but where are you? Your body is here with me, but your mind is on the other side of town. And you're messing me around. And that ain't right. Don't act like y'all don't know that song. Where are you in terms of your spiritual relationship? Because you can be in church and never be in Christ. You can teach Sunday school and never know Jesus Christ. You can preach the gospel and never know who Jesus is. Sing in the choir, or usher, sit in the pews and be here physically every Sunday. But spiritually, you are far from him. Adam, where art thou? And the Bible has a sense of humor. You got, to, you got to read the Bible with your humorous eyeglasses on. Because Adam and Eve are hiding in the garden behind a tree from God. How you like them apples? They are hiding behind a tree in a garden from God. God made them. God made the garden they in. God made the tree they hiding behind. And they call themselves hiding from God. But sin will always make you hide. Sin and shame will always put you behind something you think God can't see, like a car, or a house, or a degree, or 401k, or makeup. Talk back to me if you can. Sin will always make you think you're hiding behind something that God made and God sees you. He just wants you to see you. I think I could get it over to you better if I take you with me to Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah said it was in the year that King Isaiah died. I wish I had a Bible reader. I saw also the Lord high and lifted up his train filled the temple and seraphim with six wings were flying with two wings they covered their face and with two wings they covered their feet and with two wings they did fly and the doorpost moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke and the seraphim cried one to another holy 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 the whole earth is full of your glory and Isaiah said, when I saw that beatific vision, I said, woe is me, for I am undone. And it is not until you see God in his glory that you see yourself in your sinfulness. 
And if you can't see yourself tonight, Adam, where are you? Not where are you in terms of your geographical location, but where are you in terms of your spiritual condition? He said, I was hiding because I was naked. And then God confronted them. After he came, after he called, then he confronted. He said, did you do what I tell you not to do? Have you eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that I forbade you not to eat? And then Adam did what all of us do when we sin and get caught. He shifted the blame. If it hadn't been for that woman that you gave me. Read it, it's right in the text. Now, now when God created Eve, made Adam fall asleep, took a rib on his side, created Eve, when Adam saw her, he said, whoa, man. That's how we get the word woman. Whoa, man. Is all of that for me? Woo, look at them hips. Look at those cheeks. Look at those eyes. Whoa, man. And as soon as he got caught in sin, he said, that woman you gave me. If it hadn't been for her, I was doing fine till you gave me that woman. And then God says to Eve, what have you done? Eve said, well, I can't help myself. The devil made me do it. I was minding my own business and a snake just came up alongside and started talking. I, I, I wasn't even looking for no fruit. I don't even know what you're talking about. I just ate something and when I ate, nothing happened. Talk to Adam. He was here. And then God, after he came and called and confronted, he chastised. Because all sin, him and tonight, must be punished God forgives but God doesn't take away consequences sin always comes with consequences Adam and Eve sinned and he said to the devil now God is meeting out judgment he says to the devil because you've done this you will crawl on your belly for the rest of your days you will eat dust and be lower than cattle the rest of your days. And then in verse 15, the first gospel message is preached. The proto-evangelium. The first gospel message is preached in Genesis 3:15. The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent and the serpent shall bruise his heel. The, 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 the gospel has been preached. The, 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 the second Adam will eventually crush the serpent. But in the meantime, sin has to be atoned for. And then God meets out judgment on the woman and says, because you've done this thing, I intended for you to just have babies with no problem. But now you're gonna be in labor for 40 hours. You're going to scream and cuss the doctor and the nurse. You're going to cuss your husband and you're going to hate the day you ever thought about having a baby. Because your pain will be multiplied in childbearing. Your desire shall be to your husband. I like this part. And he shall rule over you. Look at the women getting mad. Rule over you. Uh, I do weddings at the church. I do, I do my weddings at the church. And uh, the, the bride and groom come and they talk to me and tell me what they want. And, and the bride sometimes will wait till the groom, the groom leaves and say, now, nah, nah, Pastor, here's what I want in the, in the ceremony. Uh, leave that part out that says obey. And of course, and she's paying. Mm. 
I, 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 take, I take my little $25. She didn't pay the $80,000 for the wedding, but give me $25. I take my little $25. And uh, they stand before me and I said, uh, will you have this man to be your lawful wedded husband and live together after God's holy ordinance in the holy state of marriage? Will you honor him and comfort him and keep him in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keep thee only unto him so long as ye both shall live? Will you obey him? And she said, shit. <laughs> I said, God, say obey. Will you obey? <laughs> I said, I'm glad I ain't going on your honeymoon. Because it will be forever the battle of the sexes. He will try to rule over you, and you're going to keep him from trying to rule over you. He's going to want to be in charge. And you're going to have some money somewhere in an account that he don't know nothing about. Every black woman in here tonight got an account somewhere in her and her mama's name or her and her sister's name because her mama told her, put you some money on the side. In case that Negro don't act right, you can take care of yourself. And whenever a black woman say, I ain't got no money, she mean I ain't got none on me. But give her five minutes, and she'll go in the First National Bank, or shoebox, or chicken in the bottom of the freezer, because she ain't going to let you rule over her am I doing all right it's always going to be conflict it's always going to be a struggle it's always going to be sin because sin brings with it consequences he shall rule over you. And then he tells Adam, because you listen to the voice of Eve, you will earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. Thorns and thistles. The ground will not yield her fruit easily. You're going to have to work for it. And Adam, I want to talk to the black Adam in here tonight. I've already talked to Eve. Let me talk to Adam in here tonight. Work is not a curse. No, you, you got to earn your bread by the sweat of your brow, but you got to earn your bread. Um, that, that's, that's, that's something that has happened in our community that is only going on in our community. We train and teach and preach to our daughters to go to college, get your degree, make you some money, walk your own way so you can take care of yourself. And our daughters go to school and train themselves and learn and come back to our communities and can't find a decent young black man to marry. Because he's walking with his pants halfway down his butt and uh, earring in his ear and one in his nose and smoking a joint and talking like a fool and looking like an idiot. And we tell our daughters, go to school, train yourself, learn, go to college, graduate from college so you can get a degree and get your own job. And we let our boy stay in the house until he's on social security. Somebody ought to help me preach here tonight. Go get a job. Pull your pants up. Stop talking like an idiot. Stop looking like a fool. Do you know how good God has been to us as a black race? If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, don't bring down the heritage of our people who have worked and struggled to get us to where we are, and now we are breaking in each other's houses. Murdering each other. Killing each other. Denigrating one another. Work was not the curse. 
I know you think it is, Adam. But work comes from God. The Bible says if you don't work, you ought not eat. Talk back to me if you can. He said you have to work now harder than you would have worked because you disobeyed. I'm in my seat in a minute. But God is so full of mercy. God is so full of grace. That before he expels the tenants of Eve, he's already provided a way of escape. He came. I'm so glad he came. But not only did he come, he called. Not only did he call them, but he confronted them. Not only did he confront them, but he chastised them. And many of us tonight can never get saved because you don't want nobody to tell you nothing. You don't want anybody to point out when you're right or when you're wrong, especially when you're wrong. You don't even want God to tell you anything. You want to walk your own way and live your own life. Let me tell you what sin is in its essence. Sin in its essence is creature saying to creator, I know you made me. I know you created me, but I'm going to walk my own way. That's sin in its essence. But let me tell you what judgment is. Judgment is God saying to you, if that's your choice, go right ahead. And God will take his hands off your life and let you be the biggest fool in Albany, Georgia. But in the end, who pays for it? The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God through Jesus Christ is eternal life. The essence of sin is you saying to the creator, I'm going to walk my own way. The essence of judgment is God taking his hands off you and letting you go your own way. When you read that story in Luke chapter 15, that prodigal son, and there is some question as to who is really prodigal in that passage. But the prodigal who leaves home the father knew that outside his protecting presence, that boy had failed already. But he loved him enough to give him the freedom to take his journey. I want to run backwards to that call of God. There is a general call and there is a specific call. He came to him, but then he called him. He called Adam by name. When I was growing up again, uh, in my house where I live, 720 South Beulah Street, Eunice, Louisiana, 70535. Uh, my father and mother had so many children. There were 10 of us in the house, uh, eight boys and two girls. And uh, my daddy would from time to time say, I need somebody to go put this trash out. And uh, I just sat there because my name ain't somebody. I know he ain't talking to me. That's what I said to myself. I don't think I got that over to you. I said, that's what I said to myself. It's nine o'clock at night. And then he said, uh, what you call him? Go put that trash out. And I said to myself, my name ain't no what you call him fool around with me I'll get with him right now that's what I said to myself because had I said that to him I'd be the late Terry Anderson because I came up in a time where parents didn't care nothing about your friendship they didn't care anything about hurting your feelings if they had to beat you in the hospital or the grocery store or the funeral home at a wake it didn't make no difference to them they were determined that you be intelligent and then he said, Terry, go put that trash out. And I'd go put our trash, the neighbor's trash, the people across the street. Because that was a specific call that came with consequences. Somebody ought to help me preach tonight. 
And whenever there is a call on your life, no matter how you try to get away from it, God has his hands on you. He came, he called, he confronted, and he chastised. Because sin has to be atoned for. Adam and Eve had previously covered themselves with fig leaves. But their covering of fig leaves was inadequate. Something had to be done to cover up for their sins. And many of us here tonight are trying to cover ourselves with fig leaves. The fig leaf of education. The fig leaf of morality. The fig leaf of our own theocentric piety fig leaves we we act like we are more than we really are and we claim that we don't sin and and uh, we act like nobody is holy as we are and and we careful who we sit by because uh, we don't want the anointing to rub off of us and and uh, you take your coat off or your dress we'll see your wings sprout out and you got a halo around your head because you're so holy and righteous and you answer your phone praise the lord and, and you got a little fish on your the back of your car and somebody asks you how you're doing you're too blessed to be stressed and you blessed and highly favored the only people in this sanctuary who is above sin is the people who sitting in the risers you didn't get that the only people above sin is the people sitting in the balcony when they come down they'll be just as low down as the rest of us because all all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God and all it takes is the right set of circumstances and you'll be the biggest homonger in Georgia all it takes is desire and opportunity and you'll be the biggest sinner in this city see how quiet you got right there well let me let me go and testify I told you last time I was here, I had to do all my sinning since I've been a Christian. Because I never had a young adult life. Uh, I've been in church all my life. And so all the sinning I did, I did since I was a Christian. Uh, I was a believer. I was in church. I was playing the music. I was an organist. Uh, I, can, I can really handle that thing. You better, you better watch yourself. Uh, I, I can go over there and make that thing talk. And uh, I, I, was, I was pastoring at 20, preaching at 18. Uh, I was thin then. I was fine and good looking. Uh, no gray hair, nowhere, no flat, no, nothing. I was a man. Uh, I was all of that in a bag of purple hull pee. Uh, and uh, uh, I was pastoring and ladies uh, loved me. Uh, and uh, I was sinning in church. Like, 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 like some of y'all. Yeah, I, I did a whole lot of sinning since I've been in church. I wish I had an honest, show sure enough, for real, low-down sinner like myself. Who can help me testify that if it were not for God's goodness and grace, if it were not for God's love and mercy, I'd be in jail right now. I need somebody who can help me testify that God covered a multitude of my faults. If you really knew who I really was, you'd get up and go sit somewhere else tonight. Look at the person next to you on the right and the left and know that you sit next to a crook. Watch your purse. Check your wallet you sitting next to a wretch undone but thank god for grace thank god that when the fig leaf could no longer cover the last word in the text is he came to them he called them 
He confronted them. He chastised them. But because he's God, he clothed them. It's right in the text. He clothed them. And in order for him to clothe them, blood had to be shed. Because sin is a bloody issue. And, and, and many people who come to church don't want to talk about sin. And, and they don't want to talk about unrighteousness and judgment because they, they for some reason have this Christless cross and this crossless Christ. But a Christless cross is secular humanism. And a crossless Christ is evolutionary naturalism. But I need the Christ of the cross. Because if I'm going to see God's face, I need to be clothed in his righteousness. Blood had to be shed. An animal had to be sacrificed. You're going to help me preach this, won't you? And the Bible says God speaks to God and says we've got to put them out of this garden. We've got to expel them from the confines of Eden unless they come back and eat from the tree of life and the sentence drops off. Read it when you get home. Read verse 22 when you get home. He said, lest they eat from the tree of life. And there's no more to that sentence because the consequences are too terrible for even God to contemplate. Suppose you live with bone cancer forever. Suppose you had to live with diabetes and dialysis forever. Suppose you live with congestive heart failure forever. Suppose Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree of life and we would live in sin forever. But no, God is too full of mercy. God is too loving to let that happen. So he expels them. He puts them out of the garden. And the Bible said he places a cherubim with a flaming sword that turns in every way to guard the entrance to the tree of life. Watch this. The angel is at the entrance with a flaming sword to guard the entrance to the garden so that Adam and Eve can't go home again that way. He shuts off entrance to the garden with an angel with a flaming sword that turns every way to guard the entrance to the garden so that Adam and Eve can't go home that way. He puts a cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the entrance to the garden so that they will not eat from the tree of life and they can't go home that way. But one Friday, on a skull-shaped hill and a blood-soaked cross, he provided another way. I believe, I sincerely believe that when Jesus was on the cross and that mean, cruel Roman soldier pierced him in the side. I believe when he pierced Jesus in the side and blood came streaming down and water came streaming down, blood for redemption and water for baptism. I believe that when that soldier pierced Jesus in the side, he extinguished the sword. He put out the flames from that sword that the cherubim had to the God, the entrance to the garden so that they will not eat of the tree of life and now they can go home another way. 
The fire has been extinguished. The flame has been put out. And now Adam and Eve and you and I can eat now from the tree of life. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinner, you ought to plunge beneath that flood and lose all your guilty stain. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. He came, he called, he confronted, he chastised, but because he's God, he clothed. And those of us here tonight who've been clothed with God's righteousness, don't you let nobody stop you from giving God praise. Don't you let anybody intimidate you about shouting over your salvation. Don't you let anybody tell you it don't make sense for you to cut up and carry on the way you do. Let me tell you what I want you to do when I'm in my seat. I don't want you to do it now. Do it, do it, do it Sunday. Don't do it now. Because they're going to know you're looking at them, so don't do it now. But Sunday, I want you to bring with you a little three by five card. And if they can't read a little writing, get your eight and a half by 11 uh, inch sheet of paper. And write on there, this is a disclaimer. If you're going to sit in this pew, it's going to be noisy. If you're going to sit next to me, you might get your hat knocked off or you might, you, you, you might get an elbow because it's going to be some cutting up. Because God came to me. God called me. God confronted me. God chastised me. But he loved me so much that he clothed me. And the reason I'm shouting right now is because he's been so good to me. So if that getting on your nerve, you better go sit somewhere else. If you don't like the noise I bring, you better find you another section. Because you don't know what it costs me to shout like I shout. Because he came. He called. He confronted he chastised, but when I needed it, he closed.